Welcome everyone to another CTC Software webinar. My name is Sean Zervis, the Director of BIM Development here at CTC Software, and in today's session, we're going to continue on the MEP Productivity Pack Custom Content, content Building Series, focusing on the train computer room air conditioner, and this is part two of a two-part series. So let's jump right in. And of course, as per usual, we record these webinars. You can always go back and rewatch them in the past. And of course, as always, we like, uh, we like when you throw questions in the questions window here in GoToWebinar. If you're participating with us live, we try to answer those questions live at the time when they get asked, uh, when it's relevant in the session, or we also save a large QA session for the end. So what are we talking about in today's little session here? Well, the whole goal of using the MEP productivity pack is having efficient workflows. And in today's session, we're talking about uh, all of this needed content, this custom content beyond what's provided with the pack. I mean, there's no way that I can provide absolutely everything. It's impossible. So it can be a little bit daunting if you don't know how to efficiently author custom Revit family content and especially if the like the the actual manufacturer doesn't provide something directly that is a good quality Revit family, but also that aligns with the MEP standards, right? If it doesn't do that, it's not going to show up in the schedules. It won't tag right. There's all kinds of issues. In this webinar, we're going to continue from where we left off in part one in building the computer room air conditioning system. Uh, we are going to be focusing on uh, a number of items here. So let's just kind of take a look at what today's topics are. We're going to refine those connector values based on the manufacturer cut sheets. Last time we had done the supply and return connector, we had flushed out the size of the overall piece of equipment. There was a few connectors that were still hanging out there, and we want to get those oriented and positioned about in the right place. We don't have explicit documentation from the manufacturer as to exactly where they go, so because of that, we're going to sort of fake it. We're gonna make it go close to the right positions since we need those connectors facing the right way. We, we know that and what their sizes are. And so we're gonna finish up those connector values and kind of get some more of the properties put in place. Now we're gonna transition off of that to building types. We're gonna establish some of our types. We're going to populate type parameter values. I'm gonna show you a technique you might be able to use to very efficiently or fairly efficiently take data values from the manufacturer's cut sheets, depending on how well built they are, and use those directly in a spreadsheet editor. And then finally, at the very end today, we're gonna to try to load this family into a project and just verify that it loads. Now, we're not gonna be able to get through absolutely every single parameter and property in the short amount of time we've got. So we're gonna be focusing on some specific things as we go through this today. Let's also quickly review the overall sort of custom content outline that we've got going on here. Now, we've been talking about introducing the, the family as a whole. We, we're talking about specifically the computer room air conditioning unit by train. We removed some unnecessary features. We did that in the previous session. We've established most of our connector locations. We're gonna continue that a little bit here today. So the vast majority of that was all handled. And in today's session, we're focusing on refining those connector values from the cut sheets, establishing the desired types and values, and testing the family loading and use in the project, specifically focusing on its appearance in one schedule that we pick. We'll show you how that works. So let's talk about refining some of these connectors. Uh, when we're refining these connectors, there's a few things that we need to do in today's session. I want to finalize the position of the electrical and pipe connectors. We have them available, but we want to refine them. I also want to make sure I'm refining those connector sizes, in this case specifically focusing on the pipe connectors because the electrical size isn't quite as critical since it's more a placeholder for a logical connection. I also want to talk a little bit about some of those MEP load values. We're going to be focusing on that one single size again, the 088 unit that's air cooled with the upflow. We're going to be focusing on that from the cut sheet and uh, entering some of its values directly in the family. We'll talk about some strategies if you want to continue to edit types in the family directly, some of the things that you might do. But then we're going to establish some sort of preliminary naming conventions is we want these type names to actually 
B, and then we're going to try to actually be a little bit more efficient uh, in the next step by actually leveraging some spreadsheets for filling some of that out. So we'll get to that in a minute here. First off, let's jump back over here to the family. It's already open in my Revit session. Uh, have this open. I also have a sample model sitting there in the background that I can load it into a little later on. But first, we're going to get these little connectors down here. Uh, this one connector there probably, and uh, this electrical connector all put onto the correct face as a little bit of a review. Now, I forgot to have open my PDF here, so I'm going to open that up now and pull this across. Looks like it dropped me into the exact same location I was last time. We are focusing on the uh, CF. U, I believe, yeah, CFU88. So this guy right here is the one that we're focusing on and it's all these property values and specifically on the next page down here, these connector sizes that I'm gonna be caring the most about in this little example, this little session right here. Now, working with these, uh, if I scroll all the way back up to the top, this is telling me the sizes of the, the copper connectors. Um, but it doesn't actually tell me the physical dimensions of where on a face they're located. I'm used to seeing that sort of in a cut sheet. I didn't actually get an official, what I might call a cut sheet, I suppose. Um, actually, I guess it's way down here at the bottom. It's probably down in this area. There we go. So all the dimensional sheets are showing me is the overall unit dimensions down here and talking about positions of some of the features. That's pretty much it. So it's not actually telling me explicit dimensions off the top. I believe this is the one, actually it's the next page. Yeah, this is the one, the TRCFU88. This one here is just telling me, if I was to zoom in real close on this here, um, that there's power and uh, control connectors here, that there's some of the piping connectors here, and that's all I get. So, because that's all I get, until I get more, I'm gonna estimate some of the positions, because that's all I can do. So uh, if I was to get better cut sheets or more detailed cut sheets, then I would simply refine the numbers that we'll be kind of modifying today. Now in this case, it's kind of fortunate because every single one of these connectors, um, other than the condensate connector, which is actually not showing me, but I believe it's out here on the side or it's pointing straight down, um, all the other connectors are actually up on the top face. In the last session when we were working with the return air, uh, connection, actually it's the supply air connector, I guess. Um, well, it's either supply or return, depends on which way the air is flowing, doesn't really matter. Uh, that connector up here on the top face was in the position of uh, 360. That's the orientation or the angle for the unit to, to be able to tell it to go to the topmost face. So we're gonna take a look at that here for all of these connectors and then control their position off of this front right corner. We'll talk about controlling those positions as well here next. So. We kind of get to um, play sort of our own game here. If I orient this unit a little bit, um, we're gonna be working with everything up here. And since we don't have explicit dimensions, we kind of get to control this ourselves a little bit until we have some explicit numbers. I believe the connectors that I'll be working with here, if I take a look at this, this is the uh, chilled water coil. I did keep that in the family, even though I won't be specifying most of its properties. I kept it in case we wanted to use that in a future session, perhaps. Uh, I also have down here the uh, refrigerant gas and the refrigerant liquid, the DX connectors down there. And then down here at the very bottom right, the condensate, which I'm just gonna leave where it is since I have no specs about that. I'll just leave it right there. I could also point it out the bottom if I really cared to. And then finally here is the electrical power entry connector. So just to get it out of the way, since it's pretty easy, it's kind of sitting right about here. We're gonna go ahead and put that one up there right now. So I'm gonna go into family types. Let's pull this a little bit to the side so we can see all of this at the same time as we see the types window, which is on my other screen. There we go. Pull this across over here. And uh, we're looking for the electrical connector. So looking at this here, uh, we have a lot of electrical power properties right here, but I don't see the actual position of the connector. And I think that's because it's down a little lower here. Yeah, there it is. Here's all my power entry properties. So the current entry angle is set to zero. That means point out straight to the right, which if we're looking at the view cube, right is over on this side, so straight to the right. And then it goes counterclockwise around the unit, 90, 180, uh, 270. And then if I want it to go up, it's 360. If I want it to go down, it's minus 360. And so we're just gonna take this connector here. 
we're going to modify this angle to be 360 to make it point out the top. Um, and it's going to go ahead and take that value here in a minute. Now, I also want to control what its origin point is. Uh, it's it's uh, datum for it is always going to be at the centroid of the object, but I just want to care what the origin is here. Where on the unit face do I want to focus? And if you mouse over some of these parameters when you're trying to figure out like what does this actually mean, it'll actually tell you what the settings mean here. Uh, right in the little sort of tool tip that pops out. In this case, what I want to control from is the front right corner. So for that, it looks like my setting ought to be number four here to control from the front right corner. And all that means is when I'm entering dimensions for the position of this left right on this face, it's basing itself off this corner right here. So I'll be giving proper Cartesian dimensions here. I'll be giving it a zero dimension, or not a zero, but a, a, an X dimension here actually in the negative X, and I'll be giving it a positive Y dimension to push it someplace right around here. Uh, and so just for that, just to kind of, actually, let's just apply this real quick, and we'll see this, we should see this connector snap right to that corner here when this applies, if I have the correct settings configured inside of here. Yeah, so it does. It, it snaps right to that front right corner. It is facing up. It's, uh, I just need to now position it to the left some dimension and up some dimension. Uh, based on the cut sheets, let's just take a quick look here. If I pull that back to the foreground, there we go. Um, so my power connector here looks like it's, I don't know, we'll call it four inches away from the edge of this, uh, this uh, return air or supply air connection. Um, and so since the whole unit is uh, 116 inches wide at the base, Actually, it's 118 inches overall at the top up here. Uh, we're going to be dividing that by four and then just subtracting four inches. So that's all I'm going to do. 118. Actually, I'll just take the width of the unit and divide that by four. I can do that in math so that if I change the size of this unit, I don't have to explicitly control the position of that power connector every single time. And then I'll also push it four inches back on the face so that it sits wherever that happens to be. So let's just kind of do that real quick here. Uh, so the X, Y position of this power connection, the Y is going to be four. That's a really easy one. Just let that uh, finish up real quick here. And then I need to figure out, I forgot what the actual parameter was for the dimensions of the overall unit, what the name of the parameter is. And I think that's down here. Yeah, so uh, the depth of the unit or the width rather of the unit is called uh, product width. And so I'm just going to be using that parameter. Copy that, just cheat. Uh, I like to cheat with those values as much as I can, just because there's less typing for me, and then I screw fewer things up. That's just the way stuff works. So the X position here, I'm going to take that dimension, the product width, I'm going to divide that by four, and I'm going to subtract four from that. Now, I don't technically need any parentheses here. Uh, because of the way order of operations work. It's going to do the division first and the subtraction second, so that should be okay. What I think I can do, though, is I can simply surround the entire thing then in uh, parentheses and then multiply that by a negative one, and that way what that should do is make this just a negative number. I could potentially just put a minus sign in front of that as well, and that might do it as well, but let's just see what this shows up as if I let this do the math. Yeah, so minus 25, that's perfect. That should put it in about the right position. If I hit apply here, we should see this thing slide over and back right to about, yep, that'll work. That's good, that's good, I like it. So we're gonna repeat this similar process here so that I can, um, so that I can have all of my piping connectors sort of on the same face. Uh, with my hot and cold up here for the, the chilled water coil if I choose to use it in the first place, and then the two DX connectors sitting over here, um, and then I'm just going to leave the condensate where it is. So uh, it's going to be a very similar process here. If I go down to the mechanical, there's the chilled water uh, settings down here, there's the return, and there's the supply. And so in both of these cases here, uh, we'll do the angle is 360, the origin is going to be a 4, come on here, 4, there we go, uh, the chilled water return there, again, return, return, is it matching the same value? It might be. It looks like there's some relationship here about the X, Y, and Z 
uh, of the return, which I might just strip away since I'm not going to try to use the overall height of the unit and automatically have the coil connections in opposite positions over here. What I might just do is remove these formulas, home, shift, end, and delete that so I'm not leveraging that logic. It's sometimes nice to have that built-in logic to have an automatic offset inside of there. Um, but in this case, I don't really wanna deal with the delta H on the height and the length. I'm just gonna ignore it. So uh, home, shift, and delete. Here's the thing, you don't ever have to be afraid of removing parameter uh, uh, formulas out of here. If you really don't want the formulas there, you can remove them. It's not gonna break anything technically. It's just not gonna be as automatic. And sometimes that's okay. It doesn't have to 100% be automatic. You do have the ability to control these whatever orientation you want. Now, what I believe is happening is the, uh, and I'm pretty sure that if I hit apply, it'll do that here. The chilled water piping angle, this is for both supply and return, as well as the origin control also, both for supply and return. That's gonna be pretty typical. You're gonna see paired piping connectors talking to each other and that's great but what i'm going to do is for the uh, x y here of the chilled water return and the chilled water supply i'm just going to put them in a specific spot here so i'm going to do uh i don't know we'll go negative uh, we'll go negative eight um with a positive four inch here and then uh, the Z direction here, the Z property doesn't really matter. So I can just get rid of it because I'm not working with the Z at all. And then for the X and Y of the supply side, uh, we'll modify this one to be the same minus eight, which it already is. Uh, the Y direction though, we'll just go an extra four inches here. So we'll just go eight. Uh, and again, these are probably not right. And it doesn't really matter because I don't have real dimensions anyway. I look through the cut sheets a number of times or the specs that I had a number of times and I couldn't find anything. So we're just gonna put those values in and we'll go ahead and hit apply. Just make sure that I'm getting about the right result that I'm expecting. I'm expecting those two connectors to be sitting right about here. Yeah, perfect. So it's close enough. And we can always adjust these numbers if we actually get real values. Fantastic, we get real values, it's whatever. The final ones that I wanna work with down here are these refrigerant uh, values. Um, which is the liquid and the gas settings here. Now this time, just for the fun of it, I'm gonna go ahead and leverage the delta position so that we can see how that might work. Uh, so refrigerant piping angle, once again, 360, the position or the uh, origin is four, which it already is set to, and that's also fantastic here. Uh, right here, we have a delta for the height and a delta for the length, and that's gonna have an automatic spacing between it. In my case, I'm gonna make this a four inch spacing just so it sort of matches what's going on up here, um, and a zero in the height direction. So uh, I think that's gonna be across the unit here. It's, it's gonna be different. We'll find out when we actually leverage this. But um, what I wanna do then is for the refrigerant liquid X, we did minus four, that's great. And for the Y, we're gonna start with four. So that it starts sort of in the same position as this, just four inches over. So they're all gonna be really close to each other. Um, and we'll just, that's kind of what it looked like in the, in the cut sheet picture. And so we'll just leverage that. And uh, here in this case, I'm gonna put a zero for the Z because it doesn't matter. So just looking at the refrigerant gas X and Y, we have minus four and we have eight. And that's perfect. That's what I was hoping for was that it was going to be eight. So it would match up with this. So in this case, I'm looking at this for visual validation, but it's using this length or uh, sort of a depth sort of um, offset there. If this was the wrong one and it was actually offsetting the X instead of the Y, I would just reverse these two values. It's, it's just that simple. Uh, if it wasn't fo facing the way that I was expecting it to. So one more time, I'm going to hit apply here. We're going to let this orient to the correct faces and they are now pointing up. So now over here we have something that somewhat mimics what we have going on in the cut sheet. So all of the piping connectors are sitting over here. And again, it's not 100%, but we can always move them around when we get real values in the future. It's good enough. It's good enough for what we need for today since I'm only focusing on the DX connectors, the electrical, uh, the supply and the return anyway. We don't really care about that chilled water, but you know, you can see how you can kind of move these around and position the more you want. All right, uh, there's a couple of other values here. If I look through the cut sheet one more time, uh, 
scrolling back up to the page where this was. I think that was page 13-ish, something like that. Let's get back down here to page 13. That's 12. Where are we at? 13, 14, page 14. This is what I wanted. So looking at this for the size of the unit that I'm working with here, the model TR-CFU-088 uh, D2A, um, the hot and uh, the hot gas line in and the liquid line here are at uh, one and three eighths and seven eighths. So I want to, of course, get those sizes put uh, in there correctly. Also, if I was going to deal with the condensate drain here, which I will, it's set to one and an eighth. So I want to make sure it's sized correctly. Uh, and that's pretty much all I have to worry about. If I was going to be dealing with the uh, chilled water, I think it's the AWS right here. Um, then it would be the two and an eighth. And so I can put those values in directly. I'm just going to directly type them in from the cut sheets. I'm just entering data from the manufacturer right into the actual unit itself. So right here, the uh, refrigerant liquid size, uh, double checking on the paper in front of me here, liquid was seven eighths. So great, seven eighths of an inch. Up here, the uh, gas size was one and three eighths. I'll put that in there. Give this thing a second to refresh. Uh, one and space three eighths. There we go. So I'll put those numbers in. I think I uh, should have probably put in the pipe sizing for those liquid lines or the the um, condenser water lines up here. We can just scroll back up and find those real quick. So the return in the supply, uh, chilled water piping size right here. Perfect. That's going to be two and a quarter. Actually, it's two probably because they're giving me the OD for that. They're specifying that in the cut sheet. It's the OD. So I probably want it to be two inch and that'll be fine. In fact, I think that the liquid line there is also the OD. So instead of it being seven eighths, I probably want that to be a three quarter, um, but that's fine. I'll just leave it the numbers that they gave me on the sheet, even though technically that's OD, it'll be all right. We can always change the numbers. They're just data values. We know where they go, sitting right there. If I wanted this three quarter, and if I wanted this to be one and a quarter, it would just be updating those numbers accordingly if I get some specific information back from the manufacturer. In fact, because I like it, I'm going to go ahead and do that one and a quarter and three quarter here. If we did it for the chilled water, we may as well do it for this too. Uh, 0.75. I think that's about right. Uh, again, we're just pulling data values from the manufacturer. So in this family, let's transition now a little bit to talking about the uh, family types, because we do want to refine the type naming just a little bit. We started this originally from that master piece of equipment. And that master piece of equipment is very generic. Looking up here, there's a bunch of sample units that are pre-baked in here. There's a rooftop unit, there's a gas-fired unit, there's uh, MUA electric, right? There's a bunch of things. And I've been completely editing here on the one that's underscore sample. It was the default that I was in when I first jumped into the family. I wasn't paying attention to the type name at all. And frankly, it doesn't matter. I don't care. The type names are, for the most part, irrelevant until I'm actually going to be defining some specific type. So at this point, I want to rename this. This family is really becoming the piece of content that I care about. So I'm going to go ahead and just rename this guy real quick. And we're going to come up with some kind of a naming convention for this. Now, looking at the cut sheets, the model number is probably the most distinct that I could possibly be using here. So I think I might just go through and use the model number as the type name. If I pull this back to the foreground, it starts out with the TR and then hyphen and then whatever the rest of the properties are here. They call out what that all means up above, what the individual um, uh, bits and pieces of this actually indicate, but I can just directly use TR-CFU, uh, I think it's actually CFD, CFU, I don't remember, I think it's the upflow, yeah, it's this guy, CFU88 uh, D2A, so I can start with that and just make that my type name, and that will also be my model number, the same time, type name, model number, identical, and I can actually make that match up in the future with one of my next tricks. But first off, let's go ahead and get that set up inside of here. So TU dash, or sorry, TR dash uh, CFD dash 088 uh, dash uh, 02A, because this is the air-cooled unit, so it's the A as opposed to, I believe there's a W for water-cooled, and there's a few others inside of here as well. So we're doing the A version. That's why these water pipes mean nothing for me. 
uh, and I'm just going to go ahead and click OK. And then for consistency's sake, because why not, I should jump down here in the manufacturer, since I never actually filled this out, and put in whatever I want the manufacturer name to be. This is a train unit, so we're going to go ahead and put train here for this. And then for the model number, since I hate retyping stuff, I'm just going to copy and paste, because I am what some people might call efficient and others might call, well, lazy. It's whatever. It doesn't matter. Uh, I'm getting the job done, right? That's the whole point. And I believe the nominal capacity of this unit is definitely not going to be 50 tons. Uh, this is, uh, where did that go? Something probably closer to the 8-ton unit. Um, but it doesn't explicitly call that out in my, in my specs here. So I'm just going to estimate it for right now, um, 8.0. And then it should fill that out because this is in uh, cooling capacity there. It's going to put the ton automatically. Uh, I should have put a zero instead of eight, but that's fine. 8.8, .8, it's whatever. Uh, I don't have that number directly. I could use some maths for this. There's a uh, airflow per ton balance that I could potentially leverage um, for that. But for right now, it's just a piece of information that I'm putting in. So it's close-ish to, uh, to the actual unit that I'm working with here. Okay, uh, so I'm, I'm getting closer, right? I, I could continue to go through and fill out all of these values one by one, continue to remove some of the values that I don't need. And I didn't mention this, but off screen, I also had gone through and deleted a few more properties out of the list that were not going to be used for our discussion. There's a few that are left here that I probably could further clean up, um, but for now, um, we're getting pretty close. So let's talk about how we can more efficiently potentially work with some of these parameters and the values for them for this type for properties that we actually care about. Now, most of the things we've set or we set relationships and formulas on ourselves inside of here so that as I change the overall product dimensions, the product width and, and, and length and depth and all those properties, these components will kind of sit in the right positions and the overall dimensions of the return and supply sides they'll do what they're supposed to do already. But there's other things that I do care about, like the size of these piping connectors over here do change size based on the specific unit. Some of the rated values inside of here will change depending on the size of the unit, the rated flow or the, the actual electrical properties or whatnot. And so I wanna find an efficient way to enter this. Now you could certainly go through, in fact, I should probably go through and really clean this up it's going to take a second um, because the way that Revit likes to work is it likes to refresh everything as I go do this. So I'm going to delete the AHU4 pipe. Don't need that. I want to keep this one. This is the one that I just made. Let's get rid of this ductless AC. We don't need that guy. Quite a few of these we don't need. And just delete these out. Any day now. I should not have rolled my wheel. That was a silly choice. Yeah, there we go. Delete. Delete. Maybe that was a smart choice because they got me the next one in line each time. That was great. All right, so we're left with one type inside of here. And now you could go through and do new type each time. It is absolutely possible. New type, type in a new name, put in the new properties. You can do that. One by one, if you want to go through and enter the types that you're going to be using either on your project or that you want to enter into your library for a continued reuse in the future, have a good time. That is, is definitely an acceptable way of entering information is to get your base value set and then just, you know, add a type, give it the new name, and make sure you change the properties that change and leave the ones alone that are left alone. Totally acceptable. No big deal. I'm going to show you an alternative that you could potentially do and show you some pitfalls you might run into depending on how you're doing this. So I'm going to hit OK here on this. It's going to let this accept all those properties. And because it's a good idea, I'm going to go ahead and save this unit. All right. Now that it's saved, one of the features that you have in Revit is you can go to File, Export, and you can export the family types. This should dump it out to a .txt file. And normally, in most families, like architecture families, this works acceptably. It's not terrible. It gives you all the family types. It builds a type catalog. It's not garbage in most cases. But let's go ahead and do this. Let's, let's actually export this out. 
I'm going to save this to our little sample directory there. So a little C drive area here, temp, and where we've got our content creation series going on. I'm going to dump this .txt file out, and we're going to go open it and take a look at how it's formatted. So if I go double click on that .txt file, this is what we end up with is uh, a file that looks a whole lot like this. But one of the properties or one of the problems with this is it tends to do a really poor job of breaking out multi-line values that exist inside of there. And a lot of these MEP families do have multi-line entries for the text. It does not distinguish in any form or fashion between what parameters you've asked for. It just dumps everything. And you can't really get this file to format out very cleanly. It just doesn't work. So I tend now to not use the built-in Revit save out of type catalog function because I find it just doesn't work well. Instead, this is what I like to do. We used this tool a little earlier, and I'm gonna use it again here. The family processor is a pretty powerful tool here. I'm gonna go ahead and use it again. In fact, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna intentionally make a copy of this train unit. I've already saved it. I'm gonna make a copy of this real quick, and I'm gonna run family processor against this copy. And I'm doing this because the feature that I'm about to use only functions well when I have it running against multiple families. So we're gonna use this to sort of steal a type catalog out of this family and have it format it fairly cleanly and also be able to intentionally exclude some parameters that we don't want. Like I don't care about the instance values in all cases. The instance properties are set sort of project by project, so I'm not gonna actually export those on purpose, but there's also some other values that maybe I don't want. In fact, within the family here, I'll just give you an example, one that'll let me weed out a bunch of things real quick here. There's a bunch of these sort of airside arrangement um, slash you know, airflow arrangement or all these arrangement properties inside of here. They've all got this sort of symbol on them and they also have the word arrangement coincidentally. There's other ones later on down here that also I believe have that little sort of triangle symbol on it as it groups things together. I'm not seeing it now. Here's a good example. Um, heating, uh, a design heating select a section where it kind of groups things together down here. Well, I don't, I don't really want these parameters. They're useless to me. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to actually steal this value right here. I'm gonna copy this. And anytime I see that little symbol, I don't want it to be one of the parameters and its related values that it actually exports because it's not relevant for me. There's certainly plenty of others as well, but I'm gonna use that to do a little preliminary weeding here. So in Family Processor, get this tool to open up here, I'm gonna show you the trick that I use to get rid of that kind of information. In fact, what I'm gonna do is brand new settings here. Let's clean this up real quick. Once Family Processor decides to load, Give this thing a second, where'd it go? In the background? Of course it's in the background, here we go. New settings, so it clears everything out. I'm gonna go here to the change parameters tab. I'm gonna use the, uh, it's already got my shared parameter file. That's perfect, that's exactly what I was hoping for. Uh, I have no settings inside of here. Last time we leveraged this, it was deleting a bunch of parameters and I don't want it to think about or try to do that this time. What I do want, over here in my select families and begin is multiple family files. Now I've already got this parent folder paths here and I can simply tell it to search again and it will find that copy family. That's the one that I wanna run against. See family processor doesn't wanna do a multi-family run against the active open family because it's well already open. So it wants to open the families that it's gonna do this processing on. And the reason why I'm using multiple family files is because if I hit current family, all of my options on the bottom go away and it's those options that I want because there's this really powerful one right here that lets me automatically create a type catalog. I can force it if I want it to, to delete the types from the families themselves, which I don't actually want, but I can tell it whether or not I do want to include instance parameters in this type catalog. And in my case, I'm gonna tell it not to do that. Don't include instance parameters. I do want it to sort my types alphabetically, which is completely irrelevant because I've only got one type, but I also like to sort my parameters alphabetically because it makes it really easy. And if I know what the name of the parameter is to just scroll across this list and find it. 
And I don't have to go hunting all over the place in Excel when I eventually take this to Excel to do this. And also because I know that I'm gonna be going to Excel, I'm gonna go ahead and just directly save this as a .csv file. And then finally, right down here, it lets me exclude parameters. And I wanna exclude everything that ends with that little symbol. So I put an asterisk and I pasted whatever that symbol was. I don't want it to be included in my resulting type catalog. So I'm just gonna go ahead and get rid of that. And uh, now that I've got that done, I'm just gonna click begin processing. And it should process just this one family, which is exactly the same as my open family since it's a copy. And it should basically pull out for me all of the type catalog data that I need and save it as a .csv file. Okay, so that's done. That's actually completely done. It took it all of a second. And right here is my .csv file that has, well, all of my data that I care about, which is fantastic. So I can simply now double click on this, open this up in Excel. And if I pull this across, I have a type catalog, 100% valid type catalog with every single parameter, data type, sub data type, everything inside of here already figured out with exactly the same data that was in my Revit project model. I don't have to invent any of this. The data is already filled. So now if I want to add a bunch of extra types, the one thing that I tend to do is I remove parameters that I don't actually want to specify with my type catalog. Some of these, like I wanna keep the air filter property and I even wanna keep the number of air, uh, uh, air filters inside of here. But there's some of these values like uh, the ACA pipe notes. I, I don't want these values. These are, these are not relevant. In fact, they're kind of section headers. They're instructional values that are in there, but I don't really want them included. There's actually quite a few of these that are set by formulas that I also don't want to include. So I can simply go through this file and begin deleting the parameters that I don't want to be including inside of here. And they are, again, they are all alphabetical, which is very similar to the parameters I have in Revit, so I can simply just go through and rip out the stuff that I'm not intending to be setting. So I can delete these values and a bunch of others as well. There's actually a whole bunch of values inside of here. This goes all the way over to the right to ND, uh, or actually I think what NC over here. So it's 26 times, I don't know, 30 parameter or th 13 uh, specific um, collections inside of here. That's a bit much, it's a bit much. Maybe it's the M1, yeah, it's the M1 right here. So uh, there's a lot of that that's in, that's in here. I'm gonna spend a little, I would normally spend a little bit of time cleaning this up just to get it nice, neat and clean. But what I'm gonna do instead of cleaning this up is we're just gonna go over here to the left. I'm gonna go find the M's. We're gonna find the model number area. We're gonna keep, uh, actually we're gonna get rid of the keyword as well. We don't need that either. May as well get rid of it right while I'm here. Model number, this guy, perfect. So it's already got model other set up and it's got that one model number sitting inside of here. I'm gonna take this one, I'm gonna cut this, control X, go all the way to the left over here and put this in my first uh, area, insert cut cells, and that'll put it right here at the beginning. Uh, and it does this goofball thing where it starts to like word wrap stuff. I don't know why it does this. I always just squish it back to the top here. Um, I think it's because uh, there are some of these values like right here, that's sort of a paragraph of, of information. Uh, in some cases, and so I'll, I'll sometimes just kind of pull that out, like delete the value if I'm not gonna actually be editing it. Um, and that just saves me some of this work. And I would do that for the rest of the ones as well. I'll go find the values that I want. I'll put them at the beginning um, and then at, right, right before model number. And then when I get done, I'll basically start from the very end all the way over and just delete all the rest of it. Not gonna spend the time doing that today because you don't wanna watch me do this. We don't have the time for this. The other thing that we're gonna be doing is then filling out the rest of these data values with the manufacturer's information. So we're gonna talk about this as well. I have the cut sheets up over here. I was trying to get some of this manufacturer cut sheet data, like this humidification properties and these model numbers right here. I wanna get these copied in to my environment. So I started to do just like a selection, actually let's go to the top here because this next sheet's gonna be a slightly better for this. I tried to copy a bunch of these data values, control C. I'm using Edge as my spreadsheet editor and Edge is a, not editor, viewer. Edge is a terrible spreadsheet viewer. 
but it's what I had as my default. So that's what we're using right now. If I jump back over here and I try to start right here with those model number values and paste it in, it ends up being one big long string of text, nothing comma separated properly, nothing doing any enters inside of here. It's pretty well trash and I can't really use that data. So that's an, an unfortunate. But what I can do, if I go back over here and I right click, I can open this with some better uh, spreadsheet viewing tool. If you guys have Bluebeam, it's even better because I can take entire tables out real easy with Bluebeam. It's got a better editor environment or, or uh, sort of selection environment there. But in this case, what I did is I went into uh, Adobe's uh, reader over here and I did not make it the default application. If I go back down to that same page, which I believe is page uh, 13, yeah, right here, here's that page that I was looking at. If I grab this information here, copy a bunch of this, control C, and jump back over to my Excel file, and I do control V, it's not perfect, right? It's not gonna immediately just be 100% spot on, but I know that for the most part, these are all my model numbers here, less the prefix of TR. This right here is my evaporator blower horsepower information. If I wanted this data, I would copy this. I would go find where the horsepower area is and I would paste it in in relation to whatever these positions for this text is. It's gonna be a little bit of copy paste here, but I'm not manually typing data over and over and over and over again, because that's not a lot of fun. That's not ideal. So uh, as much as you can do to save yourself time and having to type individual values, this is how I tend to do that. I use Excel and the power of Excel and spreadsheets to be able to work with these tables of data. Now the manufacturer's tables don't always align with the orientation I want, but I can always cut and paste or copy and paste data around, not that big of a deal. It's really pretty easy once, uh, once you uh, start getting down you know, the hang of it and you can build up entire catalogs of data quite quickly. I would say within an hour, uh, yesterday I was doing some testing on this, within about an hour I had gotten almost all of Train's data put in and then I didn't save and I left at the end of the day and my computer shut off and I lost the information because I don't practice what I preach which is save often. So I don't have that file to just pull out and Betty Crocker for you. We, uh, we just have this one type that's more or less fully flushed out. But what we are going to do is we're going to move on into the next little step. Actually I didn't progress forward in my PowerPoint over here. I just kind of went into the next topic. So let's just rehash this real quick, what we just did. We were talking about spreadsheets for type editing. And within this, we talked about exporting the types using native Revit. Now the problem with this is it does have some fairly significant limitations because you can't filter anything, you can't exclude any parameters, you can't do any sorting, and it doesn't format very well. So this is one that I've sort of stopped using. Instead, what we did was we exported the data, these types, using the family processor tool. And the nice thing about this is, first off, well, it works, but secondly, I can filter for the parameters that I want, uh, and I can very easily include or exclude instance parameters. You can also do sorting of both the type names and the parameter names when it dumps them out so that it's much, much easier to navigate and use that resulting type catalog. Um, that you can then turn around and directly use. We also established type names. We did that within Revit directly. We kind of picked a type name. And there's a couple of things you can do with this. Now we, we did the model number as the type name and you can continue to manually type out type names. It's not that big of a deal. Over here, my type name is gonna match whatever my, my model number happens to be. If I had all these model numbers filled in here, in fact, let's just uh, cut this, I'm gonna delete this guy and paste them all right here. Oop, I lost the cut. Let's try it again. Control X, Control V, there we go. And I wanna prefix each of these with TR just because that's what they're all supposed to be. And I'm gonna get, oop, copy, paste. Let's put this back in here. Uh, let's get rid of the 088 uh, CFU because that one we've already got. We'll put that in the right spot here in a minute, but the rest of these guys, I want them to be prefixed with that, uh, that value. So um, it's just a simple, you know, oops, uh, CFU, yep, CFD, paste. I was actually only doing the, uh, the down flow, I believe, 
uh, air, not the upflow, but we'll go ahead and just quickly put these values in here anyway. Paste. I did do the CFD. So the CFU is the one that I didn't actually uh, flush out there. Um, copy this straight down here, and we'll put in CFU. So uh, CFU capital. So with these, if I wanted my type names to match up with this, I could simply just copy and paste this over. But in the future, in the future, as I make changes, I don't necessarily always remember to recopy and paste values. So with this particular file, what I like to do is I like to set up sort of a, a more automatic way of, of doing this, you know, because if I'm doing five to 20 different type names, copy paste is not a bad thing. Typing in the names manually, not a big deal. But what I prefer to do and just standardize myself on is much more of a semi-automated sort of type naming convention. And what I like to use for this is sort of an Excel equals formula or an Excel concatenation formula. If there was multiple parts of data from this uh, data collection over here that are used to build up the type names, it's far more efficient for me to build that up and build up my model numbers based on those individual pieces of data. Now, I didn't go hunt out and figure out exactly which the properties are for upflow, downflow, which I could have done because there's a checkbox that actually says if it's up or down. Um, but uh, what I can do here just for the simple form is just equals this, right? This is the easiest way. And then all of my type names will match up exactly with whatever the model numbers in this case happens to be. Or if I did want a prefix with a value, like if I wanted, you know, if it was pre-coil air filters to do a thing, to say something, or number of filters, or number of motors, or whatever, I could have those be a part of the naming convention over here by simply, um, you know, equaling uh, equals this value uh, plus whatever else I wanted to do or and whatever else I wanted to do, it's actually an and symbol, and it would then start to combine these values together. And then let's just get rid of this here. And I now end up with a model number if I was to expand this out that has that suffixed in there, right? So I like to do this where I can when it makes sense, Otherwise, it's just an equals value to equal the model number since that was the standard that we actually went with. So I'm going to get rid of this. I'm going to get rid of all this stuff down here because I'm not actually going to be using any of this data for the next little portion here. We want a clean type catalog. So we want to now actually make this a proper type catalog. So I'm going to save this file. Now, normally I would actually save this as an Excel file, an XLSX, because I want to keep this tab that actually has my formulas and my relationships built up, especially if my model number and my type names were all built up and baked in together. Here, I'm not gonna do that. I'm just gonna save it for sake of time, and we're gonna go and rename this file to the proper file type that it's supposed to be, and we're gonna move on to the next step, which is testing the loading uh, of the type catalogs uh, and testing just the loading of the family and placement of the families. So when we're testing this, you always wanna make sure you test your content in some kind of sample file, always. Always 100% test your content. Try and, and put it through its paces as best as you can. If you don't, I guarantee your designers, your engineers will find something wrong with what you put together. It's just gonna happen. So we're gonna always test this. The testing involves loading the family in the first place, making sure it loads right, making sure that you have proper type selection, doesn't error as you actually load it, and then you're gonna place an instance or some instances in the model. You're gonna verify that it places as you'd expect it to. You probably wanna do some connecting to it as well, but then finally, you wanna make sure you can validate its existence within your schedule. That's really key. So let's go test this. Let's, let's prepare for and test this out. Now to test this, I need to take this CSV file and make sure that it lines up with my, uh, with my air handling unit down here. This .txt file that's sitting out here, this one's not gonna work. It's gonna be really garbage because this is the one that has all that extra stuff in it that we didn't fully flush out because it's got those paragraphs of text and Revit's just not gonna analyze this one very well. So we're gonna delete this guy, delete it 100%. We're gonna take this one up here on the top we're gonna create a little copy of it so we can you know, have a, a backup of the original one that we've got and simply name it .txt. 
so that it sits right next to our family. The file name of our family and the file name of our type catalog ought to be the same. And then when we go load this .rfa into a project model for the first time, if we use the traditional Revit load command or if we process it into a content management system like Hive, it will read the fact that we've got a text file sitting out here. What will not work is if you're sitting here in Revit and you just load this family into a project. It will completely ignore the type catalog. It will only use the data values that you have in the family itself, uh, and it will not look to that text file at all. So what I'm gonna do is jump over here, just make sure this is saved. It should already have been, but jump over to the cover view here of my sample testing project. And uh, I'm gonna simply use the insert load family command. When I do this and I browse for wherever this family belongs or wherever this family exists and I load it, if I go to my content creation series right there is my train family. With this family sitting right here, there's a type catalog sitting next to it even though I don't see it and my end users wouldn't see it either. But when I load from this, I'm gonna get the special type catalog functionality, except for I've got an error because I screwed something up. Well, this is why you test, right? Um, Column three, the value equals error value formula. It doesn't like the fact that my my column has some kind of an equal sign in it. So yeah, it's not gonna load up the type catalog at all. So that would mean we have to troubleshoot this. Well, that's probably, let's just go check this out. If I go into the text file itself, column three, one, two, parentheses, trip breaker, that should be fine. Oh, there's still some of that extra stuff in here because I didn't delete some of these extra bits of information. That's probably where it's upset about because there's a lot of these data values that are potentially problematic. And then I also left a whole bunch of empty data rows inside of there. So I'm getting a bunch of commas. So in my Excel file, I wasn't extraordinarily clean about that. I should probably clean this up. In fact, I should clean this here as well. So let's go see if we can fix this real quick. Uh, if we can't fix it real quick, then we will uh, just pretend that it worked and use the other load direction and see the, the scheduling side of things. Take this CSV, change that name, and uh, let's make this full height and go figure out which column it is that has all that extra entered text inside of it. Uh, it's not that one, it's this one right here. So we're gonna just delete this out. Hopefully that will help us. This one here also, we're gonna delete that one. That one doesn't need to be there. I think the rest of this ought to be okay. Yeah, that should all be all right now. Some of these are still doing a little bit of a word wrap, but I don't think that's going to cause too much of a problem, though I'm gonna delete it just in case. I don't want it to be causing any problems with the loading. This is sort of due to me not having fully cleaned this up and there's some residual properties inside of here that aren't necessarily needed, but, uh, and they might be causing me a little bit of a conflict here because I didn't clean up everything. It's quickly scanning as I'm scrolling across, seeing if I see any other two line items in the mix. And I don't see any yet. There's one. This guy, I'm just gonna get rid of this. There's no economizer on this anyway. So actually all these economizer properties really aren't needed. So I can get rid of all of them. And nice thing again, they're all alphabetical. So it makes it real quick and easy to clean this up. And I think I then solved the problem for that one. Hopefully this should be okay and should allow us to work with the data. Let's save this, close this, see if it'll load this time. Uh, if I switch this back to a .txt. And, oh, there was one more item. Nope, there was one more item that I wanted to do. I forgot a whole bunch of data in here that I had copied and pasted. And I'm just gonna delete all those rows of information so that there's no fake you know, ghost data sitting down here, which should hopefully once again, make this file a bit shorter and make it a bit more usable for me. And that should hopefully get rid of some of those errors. So TXT, go, change the name. Just double check real quick here. Did I not change the name? One, two, three, TXT. Change the name, please. Uh, I have it open somewhere, somehow. Oh, no, it did it, okay. 
Uh, yep, that looks a lot more clean. Hopefully this will let me actually load this into my project correctly now. One more try. Cancel, load family, browse to that. And there's my family and that works perfectly. All right, so there was definitely some of that residual trash down below that was causing me a bit of an issue because I didn't fully clean it up. All right, so this now in theory, when I load this, should bring into my project a single CyberAir DX um, perimeter precision family with this one type, because it's the only type that I've got. Um, but if I had additional types, I could be very selective, of course, about this. I'm gonna go ahead and hit okay. I'm expecting to see no errors as this loads. Just keep an eye out for any errors that might pop up. And then um, once I have that, so yeah, the, there was a warning about um, parameter chilled piping doesn't exist in the family, that's fine. So I may have been specifying a parameter that doesn't actually exist or cannot be set within the family because it was being driven by a uh, formula. So most of these are probably all gonna be benign. Yep, that's all good. These are all okay. These are all those delta properties that I can't actually set. So it's gonna just ignore them and that's all right. Now I also wanna make a placement to this family someplace. One of the best places to do this is in the test elements views. If you have a testing spot in your sort of sample project file, I'm gonna jump over to the mechanical floor plans, just grab the overall elements test plan here, and I'll probably use some of that mid-size mechanical equipment placement. Uh, so this sample model that's provided is actually one that we expect you to be doing testing in. You can drop your content in here, it should have all your schedules. It should have basically every instance of every family placed. And you can then verify the graphics. You can verify the schedulability. All of this is able to be verified directly from this sample model. And you can further customize this sample model, changing colors, changing standards, whatever it is you need to make it yours because the expectation is from this sample, you'll cut your own templates uh, directly off of it. So uh, I'm gonna go over here to the VRF equipment because I'm actually gonna be using that particular schedule um, as the schedule to drop my content into. I'm just gonna place it out here in the middle of nowhere. I probably should make a little heading for it, just like there's text out here, probably call out like a computer room air conditioning units and just kind of drop that out there. But in this case, I'm gonna go ahead and use the test elements uh, design option. And I'm gonna create an instance of that family in this view once it activates this test elements view system. In the view itself, I should be activating that design option to kind of keep this content isolated uh, sort of from the main model. Give this item a second. Of course, in web presentations, this always takes a minute for it to, uh, to allow me to edit that. Fun. So then the very, the, once this is done with its editing, there we go, now it's up. We're gonna be placing this and then making sure that this unit shows up within the, uh, I believe it was the fan coil. Yeah, it was one of these fan coil components here. So I could use either the specification or the all types or you know any one of these. I was just using this as an example. You can use any schedule you want. Uh, in my case, I just chose this one here uh, as my example. So if I go to the filter for my schedule, one of the items I need to make sure that I have set is that anything that's gonna be appearing in here has this schedule or this, this uh, schedule filter value set on it, fan coil unit. Or if I was using you know, a different one, it would, might just be fan coil or whatever, right? So I'm gonna copy this value because I know that I'm gonna have to set that in my family since I had not yet set it. We're gonna be setting it here and then modifying that once I get a family placed. So let's go place this family real quick. Families, uh, mechanical equipment should be, and I've got the, uh, what did I call that? I forgot, um, should be called out inside of here as a Titus unit. Indirect, what did I call it? Cyber air, I'm in the wrong section completely. Cyber air, there it is, there's my uh, component, there's my one type that I asked for it, uh, asked of it, uh, drag and drop this into my view, have it place this component here in my model. Uh, looks like I didn't control any of the clearance components on there, so it potentially has clearances on all four sides, 
but this unit does drop in. This unit does have its connectors. Uh, in this case, it looks like that shifted off to the side a little bit. And so I might wanna re-modify some of these values here in this particular family. Maybe it got a positive setting instead of a negative setting, so it's pushing it the wrong direction. That's entirely possible. So I would wanna go take a look at that in my type catalog, which may have caused, uh, when I exported that, it might have reversed a value or something. So I wanna just double check that later on. Within here, if I wanted to see this in a schedule now, I do need to make sure that within the family, and I probably should have put this into the core family, it's just a note that I'll take for myself, down underneath the data, I believe, in the data section. Up here, where is it at? Text? Nope. Uh, where'd it go? Where does it go? forgot where that was. It's called schedule filter and I'm just I'm trying to figure out where I where that where that particular parameter value went. Maybe it's identity data. No. Data. It is data. It was just in a different area. Um but it doesn't have schedule filter. Where did I put that that property? Let's go take a look in the original family. If I jump back over here, take a look in the family types, I can actually search for that. It'll make my life a little easier. Schedule. Let this filter down real quick. That is uh, schedule. Oh, it's in text. That's where it goes. This by default is told to go into the master schedule filter, which is actually not what I want. So what I'm going to be doing here is modifying this saving my original family, but also editing it back in the text values on the other side. So it goes to the fan coil, which is where I wanted it. So I'm gonna hit apply, hit okay. Oh, and it's also an instance parameter I'm noticing. So that is, uh, so it says default, it's an instance property. So back here, I would want that to be the default to make my life a little easier. That's actually gonna be over here in the, the properties in this area. There it is, schedule filter, fan coil unit. That should now be able to, dis to display within that particular fan coil schedule uh, automatically when I go to that schedule. So you'd wanna just go visit it, make sure it shows up. In this case, because it's in my test elements um, uh, design option, it's probably not gonna show up right away. I'll have to actually modify some settings and that might take a minute. So we'll do that here in just a minute. All types, go take a look, probably won't have one. Yeah, it's not sitting out here just yet, but that's just because in the filters for this, fan coil unit is correct, uh, but its uh, phase filter or visibility graphic settings are told not to show the, the test elements in this view. I would want to turn off its view template and actually set that. So, or I could place that unit someplace in the main model and uh, throw it into an actual space. That would be another option so that I would, I would have it in the model. But for sake of time, and we're already over time here, what I'm probably gonna do is just jump back over to the uh, PowerPoint here. We've talked about the workflow. We've talked about um, the uh, how to refine your connector values from your cut sheets, how to establish your uh, desired types and values. And we talked a bit about the family loading and testing. Certainly that's up to you to make sure you fully test out your content in a project environment. That'll make your life uh, a whole lot easier. So all that's been covered. So with that, we're gonna probably shut it down today. Uh, we'll be doing Q&A here in just a moment. But for those of you who stuck through to the end, of course, thank you. We always appreciate that. Um, if you do have any questions, continue to throw them in the QA window. I see some questions sitting there now. We're gonna be answering those in a minute. For those of you watching this as a recording, certainly you can throw questions into the, uh, into the YouTube video as well. And uh, we'll try to get back to you and answer those as soon as possible. So with that, let's jump into the question side here. I see two. These are some fairly long questions or potentially comments. So give me a second as I read through this. Um, there are uh, separate parameters for some different pipe sizes uh, in the manufacturer's connector sizes. Um, one of those sizes is almost always smaller than the energy code. Okay, that's great. Uh, based on ASHRAE 90.1, yep. So um, if you're gonna be scheduling uh, to connect these units based on the 90.1 and not the manufacturer's pipe sizes, if that's your choice, which is kind of your comment here, uh, you, you can either modify the, the, the size values of the pipes to be what the manufacturer says, that's what you want, 
or if you're trying to match 90.1, modify to match that. Here's the deal. The, the glorious thing is that if you're working with uh, this content, you can make it your own. You can do whatever you need. Now, you can do this one of two ways. You can either have a second set of parameters, which is the manufacturer's design parameters, and then the actual modeled parameters. You'll see that actually a lot inside of our families, where we have a design value, and then there's also going to be an actual value. There's airflow properties that are design airflow properties. If I scroll down here a ways, um, supply, nope, down in the mechanical area here find an example mechanical flow a good example so there's there's a supply airflow rate this is the actual connected value but there's also a supply fan capacity which is leveraging some formulas in this case to figure out some numbers but you could you could definitely have a capacity or an, a rated or a nominal size separate from the actual connected elements and then when you're talking about the actuals, you're going to want to pass those actual data values through. So if you're going to be making your own pipe sizes, have a good time. You can do that. Or you can just override the value to match what it is you need based on, the, based on what you interpret from the manufacturer's cut sheets. Totally up to you. You can do whatever you need. Sizing-wise, these are your families. You can customize them. There was also a comment about uh, when I was exporting the families out using either the built-in or the uh, family processor method to build those type catalogs. Um, there was a comment about, hey, can you not do a specific thing? Can you not specifically select the parameters you do want rather than removing the ones you don't want? The current function of family processor is to rapidly rip through families and make changes. And as a convenience on that last tab, it does let you dump out a type catalog. Its purpose is not to officially be a type catalog builder tool. Um, we actually have talked about having a tool like that to make this portion right down here a bit easier. It never has made it into production yet, but if you've got some wishes around that, we always encourage you, if you wanted to jump over to the little support channel here, contact support right here, there's an option in there to actually submit a feature or a feature request or a wish list item. And if you think that's a valuable tool, Honestly, we listen very closely to what it is our customers want for tools. If you want that and you can, you know, it, you, you find that might be valuable for you, then put your voice behind it. I mean, certainly it's something I'd love to do, but I want to only build tools that our customers want. So uh, if you've got, I don't want to just, you know, devote dev time because I think it's a cool tool. So certainly um, that's not a feature of what Family Processor does, but it could be a feature of a tool that we develop in the future. Uh, if we get enough wish for it. Looks like that's the uh, the last question or comment that came through. So we're going to jump back to the final thank you slide, say one final thank you to everybody. We look forward to seeing you in future CTC webinars. We hope you found this little mini series helpful. Um, obviously, we didn't get to cover every nook and cranny of the families, but uh, hopefully still you get value from this and you can leverage this as you jump into building your own family content, leveraging some of the talking points that we, we mentioned, some of the examples that we provided. So uh, thank you again, and we look forward to seeing you in the next CTC webinar. Have a great day.